morning to everybody. We're glad that you came out to be with us this morning. Uh, as usual with this COVID-19 thing, we're few in number, but uh, the minimum was, according to the Lord Jesus Christ, where two or three are gathered together in my name. We got more than the two or three, so we're going to have church, worship the Lord, have a grand time. Uh, in your bulletin, a uh, couple, couple notes there. Uh, out of the fellowship hall, most of you have seen the large box uh, with the gift wrapping. Uh, put your Christmas cards in there. We'll hand them out next Sunday. Uh, Wednesday the 23rd, which will be a week from this coming Wednesday, uh, Bible study will be canceled. Uh, in place of Bible study, we're going to do something we haven't done in a long, long time. We're going to have a candlelight service. And uh, if you've never been to a candlelight service, you might want to just show up. It's a fun service, 45 minutes to an hour. It's you know, not really a long service or anything, but uh, just love to see everybody who can come out and be with us. Uh, remember our missionary, Sandy Timisberry? <coughs> Got a note from her the other day. <coughs> Apparently, her apartment is running rampant with mold. Uh, the problem is, the two apartments next door to her are not occupied. So it's a cold wall on one side and a cold wall on the other side, which allows condensation and mold and all sorts of stuff. I uh, just remember Sandy, if you would. Remember Brother Charlie McGrew? Stainless steel kill is our collection plate. And of course, we're still doing the social distancing thing. Somehow it got left off of the bulletin. We'll try to get it back on for next week. Uh, remember, all of our prayer requests are on the right hand side. <coughs> Anybody else have anything you'd like to share with us this morning just before we start church? Yeah, I want to thank whoever gave us the Christmas gift, the cow and the big tree. So whoever you are, I thank you. He said it was from Santa. I shook it. It sounds like chocolate. <laughs> Lord, you're drunk. You ain't gonna get it. Brother Bob, would you stand and ask God's blessing on our service this morning? Almighty oh God, we come before you this morning so grateful for what you've given us thus far. Thank you for giving uh, Sandy and Jim the, the good news that they don't have the coronavirus and uh, there's a false positive. So, what a wonderful blessing for that. And people, those that have already contacted the coronavirus, if they can shake it, come out okay at the end of it. And be with us and help us to avoid being exposed to it. Be with those that are fighting for whatever rights that they feel like they're defeated and fight about the Columbus. That will work out for the best work, you know. Be with us throughout this day and throughout this service. We can look more with the words for his face. He said, We ask the first holy name. Amen. 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 Now it's time to turn your pages to 92. Turn back to Campbell, stand up and sing with me. Thank you. 
time for prayer at last. Uh, remember uh, Brother Red, his daughter Carol, and sister Miranda recovering from COVID. Remember Brother Jim and sister Sandy. Remember Sister Holly and Aunt Dorothy. Remember Sister Mina Williams. Remember Sister Julie and her health needs. Remember Brother Harry and his health needs. Remember Brother Chuck and Sister Rosie. Brother Chuck's friend, Scott Hackenberg, has cancer. Brett and Amanda have various problems. Brother, remember Brother Randy and Sister Barb. Remember Dave Swinger and his recovery. Remember Brother Larry and Sister Lee Faust. Remember Virgie Johnson and her health. Remember Vicki Carmichael and her health. Remember Jenny Witt recovering from a car accident. Remember Dwight's sister's family lost their mother a month before Christmas. Anybody else have a request? Our daughter-in-law, Julie, is having an MRI on Wednesday. Anybody and else? Remember uh, Larry's wife, Lee? She, she wasn't feeling good last week. Mm -hmm. So she's sick. Anybody else? Charlie's having an EEG tomorrow, and Barb starts uh, an IV of iron fluids tomorrow also. So, mm -hmm. anybody else? If not, Sister Sandy, do you like to actually word for whatever you need to request? Lord, we come to you this morning, Lord, with just open hearts, Lord. We want you to fill us up. Father, give us what we need, Lord, in this time of trouble out here in this world. Father, we ask you, Lord, to reach down and touch America, Father. Mm -hmm. Take care of the world that you give us, Lord. And Father, just be with the people that are kind of discouraged, people and their loved ones with mm -hmm. crime. Father, you, you absolutely are in control. I thank you, Lord, for taking care of me. Thank you, Lord, most importantly for your son, mm -hmm. Jesus. For that salvation, Lord, that I was able to receive one day, make my way to heaven. Thank you for taking care of all of our loved ones, our lost loved ones, as well as saved. Father, we just put our lives in your hand, because we know all things work together for the good to those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And I love you today, Lord. Amen. Amen. Who wants to be first this morning to just praise the Lord? Give him a hand of applause or just raise your hand and say, I love Jesus. Who wants to be first? Anybody got a song? Okay, well, we'll just go right straight into the message. Um, in the last uh, couple of weeks, we spent time reminiscing about the first 30 years of Jesus' life. Uh, we started two weeks ago, uh, the first 12 weeks, and then last week we talked about from his 12th birthday, or not a 12th birthday, but from the time he was 12 and they went to Jerusalem for the Passover, from there up into the start of his three and a half year ministry. And you know, if you look at 12 to 30, that's 18 years. And I would really like to have about that much information about what Jesus did in those 18 years. And uh, you can search all of the history books, you can search all of the legend books and so forth. Uh, there is literally nothing. Well, I won't say nothing. <clears throat> there are some legends. One of the legends is that Joseph of Arimathea was actually Jesus' uncle. That's a stretch. Uh, I, I, just, I just don't believe it, just to be honest with you. In the first place, if Joseph of Arimathea was Jesus' uncle, uh, he couldn't have been his father or his stepdad's brother because that would have made two Josephs in the same family. And the only person I know that does that is a guy named George. He's got son George I and son George II and son George III and son George IV. Somebody asked him one time, uh, 
why did he name all of his sons George? And he said, that way I can get their attention with just one name. And he does. He gets their attention with just one name. George! Everybody comes running to see what dad wanted. But other than that, you know, families don't name two or three children the same name. So it wouldn't have been Joseph's brother. It would have had to have been Mary's brother. And Joseph was of Arimathea. Mary uh, was of either Nazareth or Bethlehem. We don't know for sure. We know that Joseph was from Bethlehem. But we don't know of Mary's place of residence, so to speak. Uh, again, the legend seems out of place. Maybe just a story somebody made up. I don't know. But again, in his 18 years from 12 to 30, there's virtually no information with one exception. <laughs> and when I say the one exception, if I could pick one exception to be there, this is the one I would, I would pick. In 18 years, Jesus did not sin. Amen. Not one time, not twice, not three times, well, of course the 12 years before and the three and a half years after, he still didn't sin. But the, the time frame from 12 to 30, we all know that's the time frame when young adults and teenagers, they get in trouble. They get into sin. They do, <laughs> they do all sorts of crazy things. And, uh, you know, when we say uh, they, get my hand up in there. Uh, did I sin a couple times between eight, between 12 and 30? Yeah, probably did. Sure did. Uh, that's, that's the time frame when most people do get into sin. Uh, somehow, I'm not sure what happens. It's not a magic thing with 30th birthday, but sometime after people turn 30, they seem to kind of chill out a little bit, and, you know. Uh, if they do have a bar tab, it's only at one place. It's not five or six bars. You know, they don't have three and four girlfriends or four and five boyfriends. You know, it's usually settled down with one. And uh, they kind of chill out a little bit. But Jesus Christ, nonetheless, did not sin in that 18 years. And that's, again, that's the best thing that we can say. But of all the things I could say, that is the one thing I would love to say. And uh, in that three and a half years of ministry, that's what we kind of wanted to talk a little bit about today. In that three and a half years of ministry, uh, he really did a lot of good things. He uh, healed a lot of sick folks, uh, blind. Of course, we all remember the story of blind Bartimaeus, Jesus' last trip through Jericho. Blind Bartimaeus, sitting by the roadside begging, heard that Jesus was coming through, throw that beggar's coat off and got to Jesus. <laughs> How many would have loved to have seen that happen? <laughs> you know, how does a blind man get up and, you know, orient himself and get over to somebody? Well, I don't know. He did it. That's all that counts. And we laugh about it a little bit because after blind Bartimaeus was healed, what happened? God, he had to go get a job. <laughs> he couldn't beg anymore. But um, Jesus' ministry was three and a half years long. He did a lot of good things. He healed the blind. He healed the deaf. He healed the mute, the people that couldn't sick. There were, or couldn't speak. There was one woman who had been sick for 18 years, spent every penny she had on doctors and medicine and ointments and whatever else. Wasn't that dime's worth the good? She heard that Jesus was coming through and she made up her mind, if I can just touch, all I got to do is touch the hem of his garment. If I can do that, I got a hunch I'm going to be healed. She did and she was. Right then, right there, on the spot, healed. Bang! Uh, there was another fellow, 38 years, he had laid beside the pool there, waiting for the angels to trouble the water. Because whoever got in the pool after the angel troubled the water, he was healed. And somebody always got in there before him. <laughs> Jesus came down and said, what you doing laying down there by the pool, man? He explained to Jesus what would happen. Jesus said, why don't you just pick up your blanket and go home? The man stood up, healed. Uh, you know, we can go on all morning here, talking about the miracles uh, 
the healings that Jesus did because they were just so many of them. Uh, one of the things that he did that absolutely nobody else has ever done, uh, historically or anywhere, he raised three dead people. Three people that were long since dead. Lazarus was one, been dead four days. Yeah. His sister said he's been dead so long that he stinks. Jesus just said, Lazarus, come on out. Lazarus came out of the tomb. I would have loved to have been there for that too, Sister Sandy. Amen. You know, he's wrapped up tight. And, you know, how did he get out of there? Did he hop? Did, did, the, did he take all the wrappings off? Uh, was there an angel in there to help him take the wrappings off? Heck, I don't know. But he came out, and he came out alive. Um, Jesus messed up a funeral over in Maine. I never did figure out why he was over there. There's, there's no real story as to why he was there. But he was. He was there in Maine, him and his disciples. As they were going into town, there was a funeral procession coming out. And uh, they learned that this was a widow woman. Her husband was dead. She only had one child. Now he was dead. Uh, bad situation. Jesus just walked over, touched the side of the stretcher they were carrying him on and said, son, rise. The young man stood up, went home with mom. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Jairus' daughter. When Jesus came to Jairus' house. The people laughed. He can't do any good. That girl is dead. Go, go someplace else. And Jesus just put them all out. Walked inside, shut the door, took her by the hand, and told her to, sit, to stand up. <laughs> up she came. <laughs> An old man, a young man, and a little girl. Jesus Christ healed both sexes, young and old, or raised from the dead, both sexes, young and old. Uh, nobody anywhere, anywhere in, in any time frame has ever done those things. If there was any doubt in anybody's mind that Jesus Christ truly is, was, and always will be the Son of God, if those three don't convince them, yeah. I'd be wasting my time trying to say anything else. Because Brother Jim, those three people were dead. And when Jesus got done, they were very much alive. Now they died again. You know, uh, it's a point that people are going to die. They did. They were buried. But you know, I really, really, really look forward to going into heaven, Sister Sandy, and seeing all three of them. Just, <laughs> you know, I don't need to sit down and have a conversation with them. All I want to do is see them. No. <laughs> there they are. Uh, they were the three that Jesus raised from the dead. In separate instances, he fed 5,000 one time, I believe, or 4,000 one time, 6,000 another time. And he did it all with just a few fishes and a few loaves of bread. Uh, I'd have to go clean out Myers, Kroger, and what's that other? Oh, all of these trying to think of that other grocery store. Right? We clean out all three of them. We couldn't feed 6,000 people. Uh, unless they all like macaroni and cheese or something like that. Uh, he did it. Uh, as an old sailor, the story about Jesus Christ calling the storm on the sea, yes. Now, you know, that, that story didn't really mean a lot to a lot of people. And especially to a person who's never been out on the sea when it's raging. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, yeah, they had a little storm out there, and you know, you know wind quit blowing, the waves went down. And it doesn't mean much to most people. But if you've seen 60 feet waves, and I have, I've seen waves you could put this church in, you know, four, well, let's see, six of them. Two this way, two this way, and two up on top of the four that were that way. And the waves would cover all six churches. I, mean, I, I have seen those kind of waves. In fact, it was really funny. One time, I was outside. I really wasn't supposed to be, but was. I figured a way to get outside. If the sun was shining, I want to be out there. <laughs> Make a long story short, I'm out there enjoying the sunshine, knowing that i got to get back in there. And I'm just looking and watching these waves as they go by. This flying fish comes out of this one wave. And he flew... Well, pretty close from here to the township hall. From, flew out of this one way. I mean, he, he came out of the water. I just happened, Brother Gene, 
my eyes just happened to look over that direction. Here he comes. And I watched him just come right across through there. <clears throat> right in the side of the next wave. Never saw him again. <laughs> but uh, unless you've experienced that, you have no real understanding of what it's like to be out in a boat, knowing that unless something happens, uh, you may not get to shore. If you don't get to shore, you're going to be in real trouble. And these disciples were like Jesus, were, were like I would be, you would be. They were scared. Jesus laying back in the back of the boat. He, he laying back there getting a nap. Sleeping. They had to go back and wake him up, Sister Pam. They woke him up. Ah, guys, where's your faith at? And again, I've never seen anybody that could do this, but Jesus Christ stood there on the bow of the ship and he rebuked the sea and called the wind to quit blowing. And you know what happened? It did. <laughs> Nobody else I know ever heard of Sister Judy can do that. He did it. And again, you have to have a background to really, really, really understand and, and really appreciate this. Those disciples that were in that boat that day, Brother Jim, they appreciated the water going and the wind quitting. And I'll guarantee you, they looked at each other. And not one of them said much of anything. Just too happy to be on their way into shore. <laughs> but he did that. He also... Another one of the things that, another story I really always appreciated. He went down to a graveyard one time. We would call the man a crazy dude. Naked as a jaybird, he lived in the graveyard. The people would come in and would bring food offerings to the gods in their little shrines around the graveyard and food offerings for the dead, their dead, so that their journey could be prosperous and not, they wouldn't be hungry. And of course, he would watch them, wait for them to leave, and as soon as they left, he's over there scarfing up whatever's there. Everybody was afraid of him. They had tried to tame him, they tried to catch him, they tried to pull him down. The Bible says that they had chained him, and he had just broken the chains. I don't know how, how strong you got to be to do that, but he did it. Uh, Jesus spoke to him. His mind came to him. And when the people came to see him, he was clothed. He was in his right mind. Jesus healed him. Uh, there are people today that spend 10, 12 15 years of their lives getting education so that they, they can be psychologists and sociologists and psychiatrists and whatever else those is are that deal with the mind. Their satisfaction rate, their success rate runs less than 10% for the most part. They have one of the highest suicide rates of any of the professions. And it's all because after all of that education and all of that study and all of that application, they find out you really can't do it. There is one that can relieve oppression of the mind. His name is Jesus Christ. And if you've got, and I'm going to stop with the rest of the message for just a minute, if you've got someone in your family or you've got someone in your friends, you've got somebody that you know that has mental problems, commit them to Jesus. Ask Jesus to reach down and touch their lives. And speak to them about talking to Jesus, about praying for his help. Psychiatrists, sociologists, psychologists, you know, they can help, but it's Jesus is the one that can heal. Now, he doesn't heal everyone. I understand that. I know that. Uh, we've got family members that have some problems there. They get along with it. It's great stuff. In fact, I just read a story the other day. Uh, a young fellow was, I think they used the term autistic, I'm not sure. Uh, he wanted a job. 
he put his application in at this uh, restaurant, and the person was looking for someone to only work during the lunch times for three days a week. And this young fellow had put down that he would like to work, especially at the lunch times, and he picked those exact three days. So the guy thought, well, you know, I ain't gonna lose nothing. Uh, let's call this person in. Well, the person came in, and as soon as he came in, he saw the way that the person was dressed, and he listened to the way that the person talked, and he thought, oh, I don't know if I can do this. But he went ahead, hired the, hired the kid, and most of the folks that worked there, they, I don't know who want to work with him, but the manager called them all to the one side, except the young boy, and said, listen, listen, listen we're going to do this. You want to do it, fine. You don't want to do it, fine. Out the door. I'll get somebody to will. So they all decided they would. And then come to find out about it, this young man had a, a gift. It wasn't a gift of perfect reading ability. It was a gift of perfect memory ability. You told him something, he could tell it back to you, page, chapter, and verse, with punctuation and capitalization. They would holler in the sandwich orders. You could go over and ask him, what's the ninth sandwich order? The ninth one? Uh, it's a double cheeseburger with pickles, onion, relish, whole tomato. He would be perfectly right every time. God has his ways. If I had an employee like that, I wouldn't want God to fix his mind. <laughs> you know? But God does, or Jesus Christ did, so many things. Uh, in fact, if you go back to the book of John, St. John, you go back to the tail end of the book of St. John, John said that if everything Jesus did had been recorded in the books, the world probably could not contain the books. He was only with Jesus for three and a half years. There is so much that we don't know. I am so glad that we have what we do know. But these events, of course, were for the people of that day. They were to prove to the people of that day that he was indeed Jesus Christ. Some of the people that day accepted him as Jesus Christ. Some of the other people did not. Obviously, when it came time to crucify him, the mob, no, crucify him, give us, uh, get his name right now, Barnabas, yes, give us, give us him. But once Jesus was crucified, rose from the grave, spent 40 days here, and went back, the Christian, I hate to use the term religion, but that's exactly what it is. You know, that's a way of describing it that everybody understands. The Christian religion was born. And a lot of those people that didn't believe then, believed now. And, you know, just as an example, let me, let me use myself as an example. I was 30 years, past 30 years old when I finally decided, you know, in fact, I was 33, when I decided that uh, I think it's time to believe. I had understood before and I, well, I guess you could say I did believe, but I had I'd never done anything about what I believed. That night, I did something about what I believed. I went to the Lord Jesus Christ, and I said, I'm sorry for my sins. Forgive me. Make me a child of God. And he did. But the miracles and the things that were done were done so that if they didn't see it, if Jim didn't see it, he could hear Gene talk about it. He could hear Gary talk about it. He could hear Charlie talk about it, and then he could come ask me, he said, that really happened? I did. It. And before long, he would become a believer. The miracles and things like that, that's, that's what they were there for. Uh, they were there to show that he indeed was the Son of God, is the Son of God, always will be the Son of God. But for us, all we have are his Bible teachings. Uh, for both groups, the group that was there and the group that's here now, there really was only one big big message that wound up for them and for us and that was of course the Sermon on the Mount you can find that in Matthew chapters 5, 6 and 7 I got to read that one day years ago and 
Well, there's an awful lot of red letters here. When's he going to put this, this Sermon on the Mount thing? Three chapters, three long chapters. But that was the one big time that he spent teaching something that was good for then and, of course, is good for now. Uh, most of his other teachings was done basically when the disciples were there. Uh, it was around the, the time where the disciples were. Uh, it was while they were there. And as often as not, it had something to do with them. Uh, fortunately for us, uh, many of those things, not all of them, according to John, by any means, but many of them were captured for our understanding. And these miracles, of, you know, just, just these few miracles that I talked about, so these three things, or a few things that he did that I've already talked about this morning, you know, those are enough that if a person really wants to make a change in their life, they're sorry or they're, 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 they're sick of the sorry life that they're living, they want to do something different, the things that are in the Bible are enough to convince, I think, anyone who's really interested in being convinced. Now, there are some that will say, I don't believe none of that. That's fine. You don't have to believe it, but one day you'll stand in front of him and you'll say, ooh, there really was a Jesus, wasn't there? It might be too late then. But all of the things that uh, Jesus did then were for the people then. We have, thankfully, uh, this little bit of his life written down for us to believe in. And you know the fun part about it is there's a lot of people that says, I don't believe this miracle, I don't believe that miracle, I don't believe he could have done this, I don't believe he could have done that. But there's not one of them that'll say, I don't believe he was ever born. Never been a historian, never been a writer that of any consequence that came up and used any kind of logic whatsoever. Nope, he was never born. They're willing to argue about the miracles, things of that nature, but they're not willing to argue the fact that he was born. They're not willing to argue the fact that he was crucified. And most of them are not willing to argue the fact that he did come out of the grave. If they don't believe anything else, those are the things that they should believe. But when we look through all of the things that... Uh, he did do. Uh, there was one real section that uh, we'd like to get to today and talk about. Uh, the time frame is Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead uh, not too long ago. Uh, he had gone through Jericho for his last time. He had healed blind Bartimaeus. Uh, he had come back to Bethany. They had gone into into Bethany on Sunday, or into Jerusalem on Sunday, come back to Bethany, gone in on Monday, come back to Bethany. This is Tuesday. This is the night that Mary will break the box of the expensive appointment and will anoint his body. This is the Tuesday before the Thursday when he is crucified. But this Tuesday, as they leave the temple area, Nobody really knows for sure all of what he was doing up in that area, but he was in the temple area. And as they left the temple area, one of the disciples uh, made a statement to him about uh, how beautiful all of the uh, temple buildings and so forth were. And uh, this was how Jesus handled that. They were up on uh, the Mount of Olives, if you will, this was the view that they had. They had left the temple area, had gone across the brook Kidron, and had walked up into the Mount of Olives. This was kind of the view that they would have seen. Uh, at least it's a part of the view. I, I couldn't get the whole picture on the wall there. If I did, it, it would be so small. Uh, but that's part of the view. And of course, that's the eastern gate that the Muslims decided they heard that Jesus was coming back. And they said, well, we can fix that. He can't get in. He can't get in the Eastern Gate. We're going to block it up. So they did. They blocked it up with rocks and stones and mortar and stuff. Anybody believe that's going to stop me? <laughs> I don't think so. But uh, 
One of the disciples had remarked earlier about the beauty of the temple and the buildings that Jesus, uh, that, that, that they had seen. And this was his answer. Seeing not all these things, I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. That was a statement Jesus made about the temple. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Our precious and most kind Heavenly Father, as we look this morning at Matthew 24, one of the singularly most important chapters for today's living Christian. Not today's living reprobate, or today's living backslider, or today's living lost. It is for today's living Christian. It is the chapter that tells us, without a doubt, Jesus is coming back. And we thank you, Father, knowing that he is. Help us and guide us in our study and our understanding this morning. We'll give you the praise for all. In Jesus' name, they all said. Amen. Amen. Um, when we look at the eastern gate up there, if you go home and pop it up on your computer, you look at the eastern gate, the wall goes down, and then it turns and goes back to the west. And down over on the hillside, below that, is called the City of David. It is the actual real estate area where the temple was. Now, I know if you've read any history about it and so forth, they all say that the temple was up on Temple Mount. That has been totally disproved. There was never a temple up on Temple Mount. Up on Temple Mount, when you take the yardstick and you measure off the Temple Mount, it comes within the parameters of the way the Romans built their forts. It was also on the highest peak point of Jerusalem, which is the way the Romans did their forts. They went up on the top making it harder for anybody who would want to assault it, uh, making it easier for those to look out and see what's going on in the rest of the town, the whole nine yards. The temple was off down in the area called the City of David, and the Bible says that it would be built in the City of David, so that's where it, is. That's where it was. Uh, it's a sad thing in a way that uh, the Muslims set up the history of the actual fly. That was a thing. Uh, the Muslims set up a course of history that unfortunately the Christians and a lot of Jews have followed, uh, but some of the research and some of the history that's been doing in the last been done in the last 10 years have disproved Temple Mount. Temple Mount is not really Temple Mount, it was a Fort Mount. I, I guess that might be the, the way to describe it. But uh, again, Jesus. And the disciples left the temple area, crossed the brook Kidron a half mile later. Uh, they're up on the Mount of Olives. And uh, Jesus had said that, said this particular statement here, back over in the uh, area there of the temple. And there was no discussion that is recorded until they get up on the uh, Mount of Olives. Once they get up there, uh, one of the disciples uh, asked him this question right here. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? There's three questions there. When shall these things be? What is the sign of when you are coming? And what is the sign of the end of the world? Matthew uses two large chapters. If you want to go home and study it, it's Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. Mark only uses chapter 13. Luke, he's got it spread, I think it starts in 17, then a little bit in 19, then a little bit in 21. John did not treat this particular statement of Jesus. Uh, John looked at a lot of other things. This just simply was not one of them. But, uh, Jesus' first statement after the disciple asked him this is the singularly most important statement that he made in all of it. He said, take heed that no man deceive you. Um, 
just about every time uh, anything of any size happens in Israel, uh, some would be preacher, uh, some would be prophet, uh, somebody who writes prophecy books uh, to uh, make, make money. Uh, they uh, write another book, issue another prophecy, and uh, try to get money out of it, try to get attention, try to get whatever else. It's sad, but, and, and I'll use an example here not too long ago. President Trump moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, Jim Baker, I believe it was. Everybody remembers Jim Baker? Wife. Everybody was buying the t shirts. Uh, you know, I bumped into, what was her name? I bumped into Tammy Faye Baker, and there's the mascara and the rouge and the lipstick all over the front of the T-shirt. We all had a laugh about that. It's the same Jim Baker. He's doing the same thing he was doing before. He's every time anything comes up that he can get on television about, and uh, he likes to talk about prophecy. I, I'm going to I'm going to say this for the record: he doesn't know a thing about it. He likes to talk about it. Uh, he doesn't know anything about it. What he does speak is incorrect. Um, he doesn't, my opinion, and that's all it is, my opinion. Mm -hmm. He does it for money. Now, it might be that he's just that dumb. If he is, he is. Yeah. I can't say anything else about him. He may just not know. And if that's fact, well, he just doesn't know. I would like for him to really get in the Bible and find out something about it. But it wasn't just Jim Baker. There were several others. Uh, prominent. I hate to say it, preachers. <laughs> I, I guess there's not another word I'm going to have to use it. Uh, I'm not sure they were called. I think that, uh, you know, some were called, some were sent, some got up and went. I think a lot of these guys were the ones who got up and went. But... Uh, Every time something happens, there's a, a, a new prophecy book out and, and so forth. This moving of the embassy, it's not in the Bible. In fact, uh, I'll tell you what, anybody wants it, I'll give you my Bible, and I'll give you a dollar, you can stop the dollar store and pick up a box of uh, uh, paper clips, and you can take my Bible home. This week, I'll let you keep the whole, keep it for all week. You look, you look through it completely, and you find every place where anything in the Western Hemisphere, the United States, Mexico, South America, Central America, Canada, Alaska, you find anything in there about the entire Western Hemisphere, mark it with a paper clip. Let me give you a, a good suggestion. Don't break open a box of paper clips until you find the first one. Because then you can take the paper clips back and get your money back. There's absolutely nothing in the entire Bible about the United States of America, about Canada, about Alaska, about Mexico. It's not there. We all think at times how wonderful the United States is going to be helping Israel when Israel is attacked by the beast and the antichrist and the false prophet. In the end times, we're going to be right there. We're going to stand with them. We're going to help them out. Did you see it fall out? I didn't either. It's not there. I don't think we're going to be here. Or at least we're not going to be here as the power that we are today. The world power that we are today. Israel is going to be fighting that battle all by themselves. It's a sad thing, uh, but that's part of the prophecy. And there are books and things out there uh, that talk about how wonderful the United States is going to help Israel uh, in the end times battles and so forth. I don't know where they got their information. It's not in the Bible. Uh, apparently they got wherever the fellow was that wrote about Joseph of Arimathea being Jesus' own Bible. One of those legends, but to make a long story short, uh, 
there are a lot of things out there that are being told, and this right here is the most important thing. Don't let anyone deceive you. The next one, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now, the other one was verse 4. This is all the way down to verse 9. What I'm doing is I'm picking the things out of Matthew 24 that you can absolutely see, feel, touch, taste, smell. It's not a spiritual thing. It's a physical thing, something that you will notice without a doubt. And this one right here says... They will deliver you up to be afflicted, shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Has this happened yet? It hasn't happened yet. It's starting. <laughs> well, they hate us. Uh, you can say the start of a chocolate cake is the guy down in South America that's picking the chocolate beans. That's a long way away from the chocolate cake. Although it is a start, it's a long way away. Uh, yes. There are people who hate Christians. Uh, there are people who would love to see all Christians killed. There will come a time, Jesus Christ said, there will come a time when we will be afflicted. We will be killed. And the entire world will hate us. But it's not yet. That's the important part. It is not yet. Watch for it to come. Watch for the signs of it coming. Watch for the leaders leading up to it. Um, Canada right now, if I went to Canada and preached anything about the evils of homosexuality, uh, the LGBT community, uh, if I said anything wrong about transgenderism or anything like that, I'm in jail. Just as simple as that. I will be handcuffed, I will be taken to jail, and I will not be let out until, because that's a no bail thing. There is no bail for something like that under their law. You go to jail and you stay there until your trial. And you just hope you can find a lawyer that will take your trial and get you a speedy trial. You might be there for two years. And then be adjudicated innocent, but you've been in jail for two years. That is Canada's law today. It wasn't that way 10 years ago. It is now. It's becoming more here in the United States where freedom of speech is being taken away. Uh, if you, I don't know how many of you are on Facebook, uh, Facebook posts are automatically deleted if the people that are running Facebook don't like it. George Soros is funding at least four or five of the fact checkers. Uh, a couple of the fact checkers groups are funded by an organization that is funded by Nationalist China. You can see where that's going. The freedom to speak what you want to say today is only a guaranteed freedom if you agree with those people that are out there saying something that you don't like. Antifa has shut down, I can't tell you how many people that have come to speak at universities, at colleges. They have gone out and protested, burnt buildings, tore things down, and the universities and the colleges, well, you know, gee whiz, they can't have all this trouble, so they get rid of the person that was coming to speak. They shut down that person's First Amendment guaranteed right to speak. There are other things on the agenda. One of the things that's on the agenda, I don't know if you've heard this one, uh, Harris, who is supposed to be our Vice President-elect, said, absolutely guaranteed, if I ever become President, I will talk to Congress. I will tell Congress, 100 days you put on my desk, reasonable gun laws, or I will write them as an executive order. 
what happens to our Second Amendment rights? What happens to your right to a speedy trial? Things are happening right now that we don't really like. This is one right here. This is one that is farther away than some of the other things. But watch some of the things that are happening now, and you may see this one come to pass. The next one up there, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him understand. In the book of Daniel, Daniel talks about the beast, the antichrist, whatever term you want to call him, about how he comes into the temple and about how he desecrates the temple. In the first place, the Antichrist has no right to be in the temple. Well, in the first place, the temple's not built, but when it does get built, it will be like we talked about last week. There will be a court of women, there will be a court of men, there will be a court for the priests, then there will be the holy place, then there will be the most holy place. And you've got to be a Jew to walk on any of them. Anybody here come? Anybody here accredited as a Jew? You can walk on it? Yeah, see? We can't. The beast, for the most part, will be the same. There's almost no chance that he will have a pedigree of being a Jew. If he does have a pedigree of being a Jew, there's almost zero chance that he would be a Levite. So, in the first place, if he is a Jew, he could walk on the court of women. He could walk on the court of men. But unless he's a Levite, he can't go to the court of priests, much less stand in the holy place. But Jesus Christ told us, that Daniel originally told us, that this false Christ, this antichrist, this beast, is going to stand in the holy place. The holy place is the <laughs> next door to the most holy place. Most people think of this in terms of when that happens, that will be the day that he takes away the daily sacrifice. When the new temple is built, the, new, the daily sacrifice will be taken back up. I'm not sure how they're going to do it. It's supposed to be a lamb in the morning and a lamb at night. I don't know how they're going to handle that. I assume, reading what the scripture says, that it's going to be just like it was before. They're going to sacrifice a lamb in the morning, sacrifice a lamb at night. They're going to burn incense at the incense table in the morning. They're going to burn incense at the incense table at night. They're going to have a big candelabra there where they burn candle all day long and all night long to be just like it was in Jesus' day. <clears throat> uh, this beast, this false prophet, is going to stand in there. He's going to stop the daily sacrifice. We read about that. That's part of that's one of the signs of the end times when he stops the daily sacrifice. Most people who are end times studiers look at this as probably the time when that's going to happen. Again, that hasn't happened at this particular point in time and can't happen until the temple is built. So we can look at that and say it hasn't happened yet. Uh, and, of course, we get here. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall from the heavens and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken to tell you exactly what this means scares me because I've never seen the sun go dark I've seen some cloudy days, you know. And I can understand some different ways that it could happen. But if the sun goes dark and the moon doesn't give its light, that can't be from an ugly cloud. That can't be from some huge um, satellite or anything of that nature. That has to be Almighty God because the sun 
provides the light for the moon. If the sun itself is darkened, then the moon doesn't have light. It's like right now, there's no light on that wall over there from my flashlight. Simply because I don't have a flashlight, I'm not beaming it on the wall. If I was, there would be a reflection. Same way with the sun and the moon. So when this does come to pass, it is going to be the sun that is darkened. It will not be because of greenhouse gases. It will not be because of uh, methane gases from the cows or carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide from your gasoline or your diesel engine. It will be because Almighty God said, well, you know, we're in Matthew 24. It's time to do this. And God will do it. He will darken the sun. The moon shall not give her light. And I don't know about that stars falling from heaven thing. Maybe he's just going to reach out there and mess them up a little bit and make a move. I don't know. Uh, they say, I'm told, that there are people out there a whole lot smarter than me that say that the earth is nowhere near as big as a star. It's kind of like a pebble of sand versus a 50-foot ball. And the 50-foot ball being a star and the little grain of sand being the earth. I don't know about that. They say that's the way it is. I'll give it to them uh, because I can't prove otherwise. But whether they're that big or whether they're not, and where they go, I don't know. The Bible says, God's Word says, stars are going to fall from heaven. The things that I've shared with you today, as we come to a close today, the things that I've shared with you, if you go back and look at them, if you look them up, they're all physical things. They're not spiritual. They're physical things. They are things we will see, we will hear. I'm not sure if we'll smell or taste them, but we'll see them, we'll hear them, we'll feel them. They will be part of living in life, not thinking, not spiritual matters, physical life matters. Those are the things I shared with you today. There's others in there, but I just picked a few out this morning because that is, in my opinion, the single most important message Jesus preached for our generation. Not for 1800, 1700, 1500, not for the generation that was there when Jesus Christ was crucified, but for our generation and perhaps the generation after us. There may not be a generation after us, but Jim. We may be it. It's today and for the past maybe 50 years, it has been possible for humanity to come to zero with the production of the neutron bomb. Uh, we can make zero population here on the face of this earth. All we've got to do is just blow up the bombs. It's never been possible before. We've gotten to the point to where we can do it. We've gotten to the point to where we can wipe out, as the scripture says, in the end times, one-fourth one-fourth of the entire population of the world is going to be destroyed at one time, which leaves three-thirds. And in another place, a third is going to be destroyed, which leaves just the two halves. The way that that's going to be done, we're not sure. We have the capability today. They never had it before. So are these things going to come to pass very quickly? They can. That's the important part. They can. And I just wanted to share that with you uh, as the kind of sort of an end, if you will, of the message of Jesus. Because this is really the single most important message for us. Once we're saved, this is not a message to the lost. It's not a message to the reprobate. It's not a message to the backslider. It's a message to Christians who are alive when it's time for Jesus to come back. Share it. Study it. Believe it. Let's all stand. One quick little announcement before Sam goes to sing. If these are your sunglasses, I got them up here. Just let me know. Sister Sam. Just as I don't know your hearts and minds today. Is there one that would say, Brother White, I need?
pray. It's a bad time that we're living in. I need the blessings of God in my life. Amen. 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 